much for joining us today for um, our open house with the Dean and with the Graham team. My name is Sarah Connell. I am the Director of Outreach and Communications at the Graham School. And again, we are so happy to have you join us today and just would like to welcome you. Um, I'm just going to quickly review our agenda for, for our open house conversation today. So we are going to start with a snapshot of our strategic plan at the Graham School. Some of you may, may be uh, familiar with some parts of this, but, but we would just love to provide an update. So for that, we'll be hearing from our Dean, Seth Green. Then we're gonna move to an autumn preview, hear from a number of Graham School team members um, um, in different areas that, that they are spearheading, again, to, to provide you with an update of, of things that are uh, right on the horizon here at Graham for the autumn. And finally, we would love to hear and answer your questions. Um, you can use the chat feature right now to begin putting your questions into. And when we get to that part of the conversation, we, um, the Dean and I will, will kind of go through and, and spotlight some of those questions and, and hopefully be able to, um, to provide some answers. And as well, I just also wanted to note that you know, we would love to also hear comments or, or feedback in the chat. And even if we can't get to all of your questions and your feedback, please know that, that we will be reading to those and, and, and reading through those and incorporating them. So at this point now, I would like to hand it over to the Graham School Dean, Seth Green, to talk about our strategic plan. Right, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you all. As I read the names who have joined us, this is an insider list of the people that are truly committed to Graham, that have done more than even I have uh, in the last year and, and our incredible team here to support us to build the mission and to really give us the vibrance that we are so proud to be building on the foundation of. So. Um, just, I want to start with a deep note of gratitude. Um, the last year has been one of the most thrilling in my life to date to be able to be a steward of such an incredible institution and to be able to be on this journey of learning and building community with all of you. And so, um, as Sarah mentioned, I am going to try to be brief. I want you to hear a bit about Autumn, but most importantly, I want to hear from you and I want to be able to make sure that we, as we go through a really exciting moment at Graham, are constantly incorporating your visions and ideas because we know that's what's going to ultimately make us the most successful as we embrace a vibrant future. Um, and so I'll just start by acknowledging that we are seeing this as a bit of a check-in. Uh, we, in the very end of last year, uh, brought to all of you as our learning community a strategic plan uh, called Lifelong Learning Unbound. Uh, we are now about eight months into that plan and consequentially, because we're coming up to autumn, many of the ideas of that plan are actually coming to fruition. And so we thought this was a perfect moment at the back to school time to check in with all of you and to share where we are and more importantly, to hear your feedback on where we should go from here. Uh, so I'll just start by briefly reviewing why we decided to embrace a strategic plan. And there was both an external environment reason, which is that the world around us had transformed dramatically. We saw how technology was going to be opening up a whole new set of possibilities for us, but also disrupting our kind of core, both geography and our core delivery. Uh, we also saw that there was major social and economic change and demographic change. 10,000 people are turning 65 every day in the US, which is our primary audience source. And that is changing the way that people want to learn and what they want to learn about. We also had significant changes internally, which we believed brought really exciting opportunities. Uh, we have now the only extension of a major university in the United States that does not have a mandate for professional education. And we actually see this as a huge opportunity to be the lone school that is out there promoting the lifelong liberal arts and using the liberal arts in its own form for deep enrichment and for extending the life of the mind. And we wanted to really lean into that mission in this new era for the Graham School. We also have a new president at the university and I'm new too. And all of that has brought us to a reflection in the work that we're doing and a goal of really pointing the Graham School 
even more directly in the vision of our president of being an engaged University of Chicago. And we'll talk more about what that means over this morning. And so with that external shift and those internal dynamics, we set out with this question for our strategic planning process. How do we lean into this transformative moment in higher education to meet the needs of lifelong learners, our forever mission since William Rennie Harper set up our school, and to be even more engaged in our world, our new mandate from our incoming president, Paul Alavisados. We engage more than 200 people in the process, and I just want to thank you because I look over the names, I see nearly 100 of those stakeholders uh, right now uh, in this virtual room with us. And so thank you. What I'm about to share is a collective work and a reflection of all that you have shared with us. Uh, and what I want to do now is just share where we came out, and then I'm going to provide an update in each of the areas on where we are nine months now into the strategic plan execution. So we set out to be the leading destination for lifelong learners seeking to rigorously explore the big ideas that change and challenge the world. And I just want to acknowledge this was a nod to the longstanding role that we've had with the basic program, with the Master of Liberal Arts, in already being the place that looks at big ideas across time and space, right? The basic program being an eminent example of how we have led in the world in Western political and social thought and really given people a space to look at these really important ideas and how they evolve over time. It was also at the same time as building on our strong foundations, a way of acknowledging that we wanted to simultaneously get into really timely ideas and the big questions of today. And so we thought that this really merged this incredible foundation that we were totally committed to continuing and this new evolution of the school and ultimately being the place where we talk about ideas in a timeless and timely sense. And then that word rigorous was really important when we were putting this together because we think what distinguishes the university in a world where we are awash in information is that this is where you can have rigorous inquiry. And that is increasingly scarce in a world where information is more abundant than ever. I'll just share that after we set this as our vision, we then said, okay, what would it look like when we grow up, so to speak, meaning by the end of this plan? We'd love to have 5,000 learners. I'll talk about where we are on that front today, uh, up about threefold from where we were when the plan was adopted. Uh, we wanted these learners to be diverse in all dimensions of diversity. Uh, and we wanted our learners to be engaged in both the timeless and the timely. And then we set out three specific strategies, engaging a broader community, extending the university's intellectual resources through more front doors, and sustaining our school by transforming the business model underneath it, the uh, kind of move out of professional education changed our operational setting significantly and there was work we needed to do and are still engaged in doing to really make sure that this school is both vibrant and sustainable uh, from a financial perspective. Uh, so with that, let me just briefly talk about in each strategy area what we've actually accomplished and where we're headed next. And then what I want to do is turn it over for the autumn preview and most importantly, come to your questions. So on strategy one, which was engaging a broader community, we've really focused on strengthening what already existed at the Graham School, as well as expanding the menu. And so on the enhancing what already existed side of the equation, what we've tried to do is think about where was the right next step for our longstanding programs. Uh, you'll hear a bit later, because it is something we're previewing for autumn, about the residential seminar, which was a way for the Master of Liberal Arts to really strengthen the experience of its students as well as give entry to lifelong learners, even who are non-degree, into the Master of Liberal Arts through a week-long seminar of discovery. Uh, we have been working to enhance the retention in the basic program. We heard overwhelmingly that people love the program, but they wanted to constantly be challenging themselves with new learning with that same community. And so as you've seen, we've been continuing to expand sequences that people can take that they can uh, really go deeper into specific areas, but in a methodological sense. Um, you'll hear more about this in the autumn preview. We've been expanding our travel study. Uh, one example, uh, this 
uh, past June was our Senite in Oxford, a week-long opportunity to complement the two weeks that people have long loved. Uh, and then we've continued, and this is um, a mention of what's happening tomorrow, our wonderful partnerships with Know Your Chicago and the National Museum Publishing Seminar. On the new front, we've also been trying to complement the foundation, which is in our minds, this set of timeless inquiry with really timely topics that really leverage our eminent faculty. And so we had an interdisciplinary inquiry series last year that had more than a thousand people participate where they could learn from tenured faculty of the university. Uh, we had courses that we've begun to offer what we're calling at scale. And we've been doing this in what we think is a very appropriate way for a school with the values of Graham. And so you'll hear more from Conway about our Dimensions of Diversity course this autumn, where we're gonna be having lectures uh, and those will be in larger form, but then all of them are paired with a small group discussion. So each week while you hear from our eminent faculty in a larger format, you then are still in Socratic dialogue in a group of just 12 to 15, to make sure that we're keeping that inquiry approach at the center of everything that we do. Uh, you'll hear more in a little bit about our Leadership and Society Initiative, which is going to be announced this autumn. Uh, and then finally, we have been working hard to leverage all learning modalities. And that has been really important to us to be able to not just be online now that we're coming out of the pandemic, but to return to many more opportunities in person and then to have many that are hybrid where people from around the world can participate, but we still have a moment in the program where everyone is together sharing community in person. And we'll be eager when we get to the common stage to hear what ideas you have as we continue to build out our in-person capabilities. That was strategy one. Strategy two has been around expanding the university's front door, which is really about if you think about part one being what do lifelong learners want and how do we organize resources for them? And that's kind of an externally driven atmosphere, so to speak. The second of the strategies was really inside out. It was what are some of the unique, distinctive assets of the university? How do we bring those to learners? And so there are a few examples that you've hopefully seen. We have a novel knowledge series that is in partnership with the Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. We have a marine biological laboratory partnership that is called the Scientific Discovery Program, where you are going to go deep into the scientific discoveries and then actually have the chance to be in residence at the laboratory. Uh, and then we've begun to open our doors much wider through partnerships with Illinois Humanities that have been longstanding, but that we've grown significantly, through a partnership with the Office of Civic Engagement where community residents can now access our doors, and through a partnership with our admissions office to open up the doors to teachers. And that has allowed us to significantly grow the number of learners who come to our school via scholarship. And that's really important to us as we continue to make sure that we are part of William Rainey Harper's founding vision, which was to make sure that students who otherwise could not necessarily make their ways to the University of Chicago can still benefit from its immense assets. Finally, I'll just capstone my remarks by saying that we have been really focused not only on building the vibrance of the school, but making sure that we can sustain it all. And so we have been working to shift the school's business model towards sustainability. Um, after professional education came out of the school, it was acknowledged that there was a seven-figure structural deficit, uh, and that reflects that it's not uncommon in higher education that it can be harder sometimes to gain the same resources for the liberal arts than for professional education, where many times employers are covering costs and there can be a higher magnitude to some of those costs. And so one of our big goals has been to think about how do we build a three-legged stool and how do we really create school community and have people that are engaged in both the direct fees, but also potentially in philanthropy to make sure we're able to continue to building this for future generations. Uh, we have been very focused on deepening our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. This is an extraordinary school. We believe it has resources that can both benefit and be benefited by people from all backgrounds. We know that our commitment to free expression is stronger when we're able to bring diverse viewpoints into every classroom. 
And so we started from a place of strength in a number of respects in terms of the industry backgrounds that people bring, in terms of the gender diversity that we have as a learning institution. But we saw in particular, as we looked at socioeconomic diversity and demographic lived experience, that we had opportunities that we were really excited to build on so that the school could become an even more vibrant institution. Uh, and finally, we've been working to expand our operational capacity so that from a user perspective, hopefully you're seeing more seamless experience in terms of website and all of the mechanics, because we know that great ideas, when they are matched by great experience, um, ultimately lead to a much better outcome for everyone. Um, and so that's a lot of me sharing. Um, Sarah, I want to turn it back to you, um, and then we can preview what's happening this autumn. And most importantly, I want to communicate that you know we're about 15 minutes away uh, from beginning to answer your questions and hear your feedback. So I'm really looking forward to that segment, especially. Sarah? Great. Seth, thank you so much for that snapshot and for those updates on some aspects of our strategic plan. We're now going to move into the autumn preview and hear from some of the team members here at the Graham School. So first, I would like to turn it over to Zoe Eisenman, who is our Director of Academics. Thanks so much, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to see all of you here virtually. Um, I just had a couple of things I wanted to talk about a little bit briefly. Um, as you can see on the slide, we have more than seven, 70 course offerings off this fall. Um, our three big courses have just begun uh, this week, today. Um, and our autumn courses are set to start the end of September, so the week of September 26th. Um, as Seth mentioned, we've added a bunch of sequences. We've got our regular um, rotation sequences for the basic program, which uh, the American tradition is kicking off this fall with its newly revised curriculum. And then we have the year two of the Middle Ages that's going to be ongoing this year. And then some of these other courses are just uh, in either basic program alumni courses or uh, in the open enrollment program that have a sequence that runs throughout the entire year. So uh, these are some great things that you can check out. And then um, Additional courses, uh, some of these are, are very, the Big Data course and Exploration Mars are two really exciting new courses that we have in partnership with the Institute for Formation of Knowledge. Um, so these are going to be really exciting. Uh, and then we have just a couple of examples of some of our other uh, arts and uh, sciences and society courses, um, you know, music, uh, art, and literature, and history, quite a variety of things. Um, some courses are already sold out, so if you, you know, haven't registered, please make sure you register soon. Um, but we're very excited about our course roster and continuing to expand our offerings and uh, welcoming, welcoming our students to new and exciting disciplines, as well as the old familiar ones. So hope to see you in the fall. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, Zoe, for those uh, kind of quick snapshot updates um, and examples for the open and basic program. And now I would like to hand it over to Tim Murphy, who is our director of the Masters of Liberal Arts program. Tim. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Very pleased to be here uh, with you all. So for the entire 30 year history of the MLA program, uh, we run our courses uh, for th three hours, one day a week uh, for a 10 week span. Uh, and just recently we've begun offering a, a new format for MLA classes called the Residential Seminar. Uh, the Residential Seminar is an intensive course format uh, with class being every day, three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon for a full week. The course that will be featured for our upcoming Residential Seminar that begins on Sunday, uh, September 18th, uh, is titled Foundations of Ethical Thought, and we'll examine a variety of ethical questions uh, with texts drawn from the ancient Greeks through some more modern thinkers, including some non-academic thinkers like Toni Morrison and Dr. King. Uh, the residential seminar is an in-person class that meets on the Hyde Park campus, uh, and that way it sort of serves as a travel study course, uh, with the destination being our storied Hyde Park campus. Uh, one of the exciting aspects of this residential seminar, uh, and Seth previewed this a little bit in his opening remarks, uh, is that it affords us the opportunity to showcase the MLA, our students, our faculty, uh, to members uh, of the Graham School as a whole who aren't just uh, enrolled in the MLA program. Uh, historically, the MLA program classes have only been available to students who have been who have applied and been admitted to the MLA program uh, and who were taking our classes for credits, working towards a degree. Uh, 
Uh, but starting with the residential seminar, we're opening up these classes to Gram learners who are not currently MLA students. Uh, so uh, if you're not in the MLA, but this sort of thing appeals to you, uh, you have the option to participate with our students as a non-credit experience. Uh, and so while last minute, I, I will mention that we have a few seats still open for this Foundations of Ethical Thought course beginning on the 18th, if anyone is interested. Uh, but more broadly, uh, this is a format that we will continue to run into the future, uh, ideally offering the experience two or three times each year. Uh, we will keep the same format, uh, but the particular course topics will change as, as will the instructors. Uh, so please do keep an eye out on your email for announcements down the road for future opportunities to join us uh, in a residential seminar. Uh, Sarah? Tim, thanks so much for that update about the MLA and, and of course, in particular, the residential seminar, which we're super excited um, to, uh, to have the second version of this and, and ongoing into the future. Um, now I would like to introduce Jan Watson, our Associate Director of the Basic Program of Liberal Education for Adults and also of our Travel Study Program. Jan. Oh, Jan is muted. Hold on. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. J yeah. There I am. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so along with uh, basic program instructor Noah Shapitz, uh, I'm leaving on Friday with a small group of basic program students to spend September in Athens, visiting sites that resonate with the text that are read and discussed in the basic program four-year core curriculum. I see many here today who traveled with us on our spring break in Greece trips, and we are working to bring back the spring trip next March. Graham travel programs provide the pleasure of traveling with others in our community of lifelong learners. Most trips require advanced reading, and you know everyone will have done that reading and be ready for great conversations. Graham School is not a newcomer to travel study. For over 20 years, we've partnered with the University of Oxford to provide an opportunity for Graham students to study uh, in the A Fortnight in Oxford program. This year, we added a one-week program, the Senite, for those who wish to concentrate their time in Oxford. UChicago Critical Inquiry informs these programs in daily three-hour seminar sessions and through a series of lectures from Oxford faculty. I'm pleased to say that both programs will return next June with details about 2023 coming out later this fall. I think travel is as important for our lifelong learners as it is for students in the college to study abroad. And now that so many of our students live outside the Chicago area, it also provides in-person engagement for everyone. We have lots of ideas and plans for future trips abroad, like maybe September in Rome next fall, and in the United States, possibly Washington, DC. And I hope you will consider join, joining a Graham Travel Program soon. Thanks, Sarah. Jan, thank you so much for that. I know how excited we are about our travel study programs coming back. And I, um, I've i certainly spoken with some of you, um, you know, about, about how excited we all are to, to return to that world of travel, knowing, knowing um, how it adds to our lives in so many different ways. Um, now I would like to hand it over to my colleague, J.M. Conway, who is the Manager of Innovation Programs here at the Graham School. Conway. Hello, all. Once again, my name is J.M. Conway. Uh, I use they, them, their pronouns, um, and I am manager of innovation programs with the Graham School, wanting to share a little bit about our Dimensions of Diversity course. As Seth, Seth mentioned earlier, this is going to be a blended format course where we have large lectures that feature some of uh, University of Chicago's eminent faculty speaking on um, six dimensions of diversity, we're going to explore in this first run of the course, race, disability, worldview, wealth, sexuality, and gender. Um, and we'll explore those in, in large scale lectures that happen on Mondays um, during the course, and then follow that up with our, you know, um, kind of basics 
Graham style Socratic small conversations uh, later in the week. We are um, partnering with a number of faculty from university centers uh, across the University of Chicago landscape, including the Harris School of Public Policy, the Divinity School, the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. And we're also going to um, end um, the Monday lecture series with a series of panels um, that will feature uh, diversity, equity, and inc inclusion leaders in the business field. And we have some partners joining us from um, Stitch, Fi Stitch, Stitch Fix all the way to the United Way of the Chicago area. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the dimensions of diversity program, we actually have an upcoming information session, which will be held on September 13th um, at 6 p.m. And uh, just after I close my remarks here, uh, I will add a link to um, register for that information session in the chat. Um, again, this is an effort as Seth mentioned, to open the doors of our university wider, to um, reach uh, a diverse uh, range of, of, of learners, as well as highlighting the excellent uh, scholarship that comes from within the university on some uh, timely topics uh, of the day. Thank you. Oh. Conway, thank you so much for that. And, and we are just thrilled to be able to bring this opportunity of uh, dimensions of, of diversity um, right across the university with these partnerships. And, and, and again, as Conway said, to more and more learners. Um, and next, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Andriana Scaramella, who is our chief of staff here at Graham. Andriana. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Andriana Scaramella, and as Chief of Staff, I support our administration and our advancement efforts. And as Seth mentioned earlier, building school community by continuing to build our culture of lifelong learning and deepening our relationships with our community is an ongoing focus for us here at Graham. This past year, we created the Graham Circle, which was to recognize our supporters and connect people within our community in meaningful ways. We also offer conversations at Graham where you could take a sneak peek into a upcoming courses, and we are scheduling meet and greets for specific programs like the upcoming Back to School Social for the Basic program. This year is a really exciting year for us. Um, we'll be celebrating our 130 years of continued education from when we offered our first courses. Um, in recognition of that and beyond, um, we will be hosting a day-long symposium at the David Rubenstein Forum. The Graham Symposium will be a celebration of our Graham community where students will be able to attend a morning mini course followed by a luncheon to celebrate the 130th anniversary of lifelong learning at the University of Chicago with our Excellence in Lifelong Learning Awards. And um, it'll end with an opportunity to attend an interactive lecture on the history of the university with Dean John Boyer, which is extremely exciting. We hope that you will all be able to join us on October 16th. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Andriana. And, and we are very much looking forward to having you join us at the, at the Graham Symposium, the reimagined uh, Graham Symposium on the 16th, if, um, if, that, if that matches with your schedule. And last but certainly not least of my Graham School colleagues, I'd like to hand it over briefly to Diana Petty, who is our Director of the Leadership and Society Initiative. Diana. Thank you so much, Sarah, um, and wonderful to be here. And thank you all for joining. Um, so yes, we're so excited to be starting off on this, you know, brand new initiative called the Leadership and Society Initiative, LSI, uh, for short. Um, which will be a year-long cohort-based program that supports accomplished uh, executives who are transitioning out of their primary career arc um, and seeking to both conceive of and also launch a new chapter of purpose driving positive change in society. Um, so what you see here is kind of the two-part mission or the virtuous cycle we're hoping to create through this program, um, which is both supporting uh, those executives in this very specific inflection point in their lives in which we've heard they're kind of, you know, adjusting their identity, their community, and their purpose all at once. So we're hoping to sort of support them um, and invite them into this, you know, really dynamic learning ecosystem um, as they think through that transition, while simultaneously activating, uh, you know, the breadth and depth of their expertise and their experience um, to create positive social change. 
Uh, and so really, you know, what our aspiration is to create this dedicated space for exploration, um, you know, in the spirit of the U Chicago, the rigorous U Chicago lens, with a dual emphasis on discovery of self and discovery of society, and ultimately bringing those two things together, um, you know, into a very concrete and tangible purpose plan, which will serve as a roadmap for these executives following their year at the university uh, on the types of roles, the types of actions actions they plan to take uh, and the different domain areas where they're really going to be driving positive change. Um, so again, we're super excited. We're in kind of fast and furious design and development mode for this initiative right now. We'll be formally launching this autumn. We will then welcome um, our first applications at the end of this calendar year and then our you know inaugural cohort will kick off in autumn 2023 so we really look forward to keeping you apprised uh, as this progresses and really comes to life over the next year um and worth noting we while we are so thrilled <laughs> to be living within Graham um, because the alignment of lifelong learning and really serving kind of a similar um type of student, uh, we do have a separate website, which is leadforsociety.uchicago.edu. I will drop that in the chat as well if you're interested in learning more. Um, and I am not as prepared as my wonderful colleague Conway, but we are also hosting a series of virtual information sessions later this fall. Those will be featured on our website soon. So if you are interested in engaging and hearing more, we would love to have you. Um, and those events will be displayed uh, again on leadforsociety.uchicago.edu. Um, in the next few weeks. So stay tuned. Um, and thank you again so much. Back to you, Sarah. Diana, thank you so much. We are so excited, of course, about the new Leadership and Society Initiative. Um, and, and as always, we welcome your thoughts and questions and interest about that. Um, so now we are getting to the best part of this conversation, um, which are your questions and comments. So I would like to hand it back to Seth. Um, to, to start answering some of those. And, and please continue to put your comments, feedback, and questions into the chat too. Great, well, let me just uh, start by thanking everyone for your chats. I mean, one of the beauties of this community is just the camaraderie and connection. And you see that just in the hellos uh, that are going back and forth. Um, I will name some of the questions and then um, continue please to share them. And I'm gonna come to different colleagues um, to answer. Um, Jason Murchie, uh, your question is about this word rigorous, and um, I am curious uh, with a little experiment here. I, I'll share my answer, um, you know, as what we are thinking about when we hear the term rigorous. Uh, but let me ask um, everyone to chat in. When you think of rigorous as it relates to the Graham School's lifelong learning, what does that mean to you? How do you see the rigor show up and what makes Graham distinctive in your mind. And I'm going to pause for 20 or 30 seconds, give you all a chance to chime in with your answer, and then I'll um, give you our best guess on that one. So far, a quiet chat from a group that I know is not quiet. OK, Terrence, fact-based, relevant, and comprehensive. Questions with no clear answers, yet they bear consideration. Thank you, Jennifer. Erin, rigorous at UFC means the caliber of professors, deep knowledge, thoughtful inquiry. Laura, I experience rigor in the way props get us to think about text in a very focused and in-depth way and require critical analyses and papers, intense and deep learning experience, deep, intense, focused, a detailed, in-depth analysis, deep discussion, thought-provoking, even after class, more thought occurs, strong, respectful interactions between and among students and faculty, engage thoughtfully, not passively, absorb, rigorous means active engagement, thorough and challenging and thought-provoking, Socratic method. So I'll acknowledge that I did ask this question for a reason, which is that for us, I think the core of rigorous inquiry is the interactivity and the idea of really deep dialogue as the core of learning. And I'll just share that I think there are probably many quotes from Mortimer Adler that I would share as my absolute favorite quote. Um, so you can see I'm not very rigorous about how I define the word favorite. Uh, but one of them is a quote he has where he says, 
that the problem with a lecture is that it goes from the notes of the professor to the notes of the student without ever being absorbed in the mind of either. And even as we decided we wanted to be in a place where we can engage our eminent faculty, and you heard about dimensions of diversity where we've decided to have a lecture as part of the format, it was essential to us that we complement that with small group discussions so that that lecture doesn't just become notes that you know, are transferred from one to the other without really deep inquiry and dialogue, but that those became just a starting place for discovery. And then we still believe most of the discovery is gonna happen in those Socratic dialogues that follow. So um, the Socratic method and all of the deep dialogue at Graham, the close reading of texts, the comparison across learners is definitely what we see. And um, you all are very, very much aligned in the brilliant comments that you've put into the chat. Um, let me come to the next question that we got, which is from David Yamada. And he's asking about, after his own experience in the residential seminar, which was week long, you know, are there the possibilities for these weekends with the basic program? Um, and so let me um, turn that over to Zoe um, to begin to answer. And so uh, Zoe, let me uh, spotlight you and sure. uh, yeah, turn it over to you. Hi, and thanks, David, for your question. Um, we are definitely trying to think of ways to engage our online students in the basic program since we have so many of them now. Um, and we're doing it in a somewhat gradual method. So this year we do plan to have a lot more in-person events that students can come to um, and activities that they can do to join in in-person things outside of the classroom. Um, we don't have plans right now for a sort of weekend event or a residential type of event, um, but we are considering it. So, you know, we're still sort of in a situation where things are very uncertain <laughs> um, to a certain degree. Uh, and so, as I said, we're, we're trying to plan these out thoughtfully and carefully um, to make sure that they will be successful, but it's certainly something that we are thinking about quite a lot. And as I said, you will see some upcoming in-person events, um, more of them this year. Uh, and probably more of them in the future too. So thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we have allowed people to be in a place where they can unmute. So um, if you have a question that you just want to, you know, jump into um, at the right time, please feel free to do so. Um, the next question in the chat is from Gary Shapiro. And um, Gary asks uh, about the residential programs and are they living on campus? And um, in brief, the answer is that for our residential programs, what we've decided to do, because we know some people are looking for in-person but already live in Chicago, others maybe from outside, is we have typically not put a formal residential piece into the program so that people could kind of make that decision on their own and then take on that cost um, accordingly. But what we have done is we filled up a very full day. So for example, with the residential seminar, you know, this is an intensive program where, you know, regardless of where you're sleeping, you're kind of all in during that week, for example. And then there is now something called the study hotel, which is on the Hyde Park campus directly. Um, and so for those who want to make it a residential experience, it allows you to live on campus and then be fully part of the campus 24 seven. And so it is the equivalent of the residential living on campus with slightly better accommodation than being in the in the dorm. So if that is helpful, um, just wanted to make sure we we answered that. Um, Jennifer Lynn has a question about the symposium, and uh, maybe Andrea and I can turn this over to you. Um, she asks regarding the Graham Symposium, October sixteenth, are the events open to the public or only the Graham community? And I know this is something that is primarily for Graham, but open to the community, but I'll let you maybe say a little bit more. Yeah, that's it. Um, exactly what um, what I was going to say is that it's definitely something that we um, we are encouraging our Graham community to take part in because we would love to see you all, but it definitely is open to the community as we're looking to broaden the reach of the programs that we offer. We think that the symposium also offers a, a great snapshot as to what students might experience when they're in the classroom. And so definitely please um, invite friends. Other questions? I see that we had a question uh, from Erin on travel study, and I see Jan has provided a comment back in the chat to say that while 
Reese is currently for the basic program, uh, both Oxford and new programs that we are developing um, are open to all. And I'll just give a quick shout out for the scientific discovery program on that front, uh, because that's another one where you can travel with us, as it turns out, within the US to Woods Hole on Cape Cod, where the Marine Biological Laboratory is located. And as we look to the future, we are very seriously looking at additional travel study. Um, we recently, and many of you were part of this, completed a study with a marketing firm called Gel, and we're just now beginning to get the data back from that. But one of the early indicators, again, we're still getting all of it back and we will be sending thank yous to everyone who participated um, with more information, is that travel study was viewed as something that people wanted more of. And so um, it's something that we see great opportunities for as we look to the future. Um, so let me uh, use this as a moment to pause. Um, in a rare uh, thing for the Graham community, I think we may have uh, gotten through the questions that are formally in the, in the chat for the most part. Um, are there questions that you want to ask live? We want to make sure that, or comments, we're very welcoming of feedback in this setting, and we mean that genuinely. Thoughts? I did want to mention there had been a question in the chat a little bit earlier, um, and we're having such great uh, conversation in the chat. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, someone asked, as part of our extend part of our vision, would the Graham School look at offering an MLA program leading to a PhD degree? Yeah, so I mean, Tim, can I turn that over to you as our director of the MLA? I don't have a great answer to that question. It comes up a few times uh, when people graduate and, and they're not done, they want to take more classes and that's a logical next step. Um, we haven't seen sort of the groundswell of interest to pursue that in in, um, uh, in any sort of detail, but that's not to say that that's not something that we wouldn't consider down, down the road. Uh, I don't know if Seth has anything uh, to sort of add to that incomplete answer. Well, so I'll just add that I am familiar with a program like this at Georgetown, uh, where people who complete the MLA can then go on to pursue their PhD, not to advertise <laughs> their uh, excellent educational offerings. Um, and I've wondered a bit about this because as we've actually been pursuing the Leadership and Society Initiative, um, we've talked to a lot of different people that are kind of later in life in their discovery. And a number of them have said, you know, what I'd really love to do at this stage is pursue a PhD. It's just something that I've always had as kind of a bucket list item. I got into my career, I couldn't pursue that. Overwhelmingly at, at great institutions like, like ours and, and like the Georgetowns of the world, it's very hard to pursue those PhD offerings later in life because the PhD is viewed um, almost solely as a way to move into the professorate and, and rather than kind of as a learning enrichment experience in its own right. Um, but when I've talked to the folks um, in other places that have done this, some of them have set these up in this liberal arts form for that audience. And so I guess I'm not answering your question so much as saying that I think it's a really interesting exploration point because the, the premise of LSI is that people are living longer and they're looking for meaningful next chapters, sometimes in partnership with universities. We've now created one pathway, which is for these accomplished executives who want to specifically lead for society. But what about that pathway for people that might want to extend the life of their mind and might want to do it differently than some of the current pathways we have and might want to have a specific point of accomplishment like a PhD that they're finishing. So anyway, mainly just um, sharing that it's a really interesting question, one that we have not deeply investigated, but you're giving us yet one more reason to do so. Uh, and then uh, John Franco has a question about the spring retreat again. And um, I think that relates to uh, the experiences that David and Geneva are talking about. And that was a residential seminar um, that one looked at the foundations of humanistic inquiry. Um, the answer is we will be continuing those residential seminars in the autumn and in the spring each year. Um, the topics will continue to change uh, so that people that have been part of them can actually come back and continue their experiences as well as new learners. Um, we don't have an announcement on spring yet. This autumn, as Tim mentioned, is going to be the foundations of ethical thought. Uh, but 
typically there'll be those kind of kind of core level master of liberal arts courses that allow people to really deepen their connection to the university and to its kind of core methodological approach. And then I see a question from Jennifer Lind, and I will just acknowledge that we are looking at domestic travel study. Um, for those of you who know um, Cheryl Reese, who is an amazing instructor in the Renaissance area, um, we've recently just had kind of exploratory discussions. And one of the observations she's had is that while you could go to Europe to see European art, um, you could also go to several American cities and see your nearly as much European art. And in a world of COVID and many other restrictions, there, there may be reasons why that is attractive and you know, even kind of cross city trips. So um, I guess I'm again sharing that these are exploratory, uh, but you're very much kind of pushing us in areas that we're curious about ourselves. Ah, and uh, look at that, Jen is a step ahead of me in the chat as always. Jen, do you wanna say any more? Let me um, offer you the chance to answer as our travel study uh, director here, if you're interested in making any comments live. Sure. Um, you know, it, it, there are, um, you know, big considerations about traveling overseas right now that make uh, travel in the United States appealing to some people. Uh, and so um, we have been looking at two areas in particular, history and politics, and also uh, art, uh, as Seth just mentioned. So we have some ideas about this and we're working with some uh, um, travel companies to, as well as uh, working with instructors to develop those programs. So stay tuned. Thanks so much, Jan. And I wanna come back to a question that uh, we accidentally missed in the chat, which is William Spears. Um, first, I wanna thank him for his point that the University of Chicago is home to many Nobel Prize winners. It's one of the, many reasons that you can engage in such rigorous inquiry here. Um, and you know, I think your idea here uh, is very aligned with some of the work we've been looking at around how do we gain access to these eminent faculty while still preserving kind of small Socratic dialogues. And so I'll just say that the same approach that we've taken with dimensions of diversity, where we have lectures, where we can access these incredible minds and provide that knowledge to a broad group, but then we pair it with discussions is something that's really interesting. And one of the things we've been looking at is where could we do that that's aligned with our distinctive assets. And obviously in the area of literature, you know, a lot of the instructors that we have at the Graham School already would be you know, highly qualified to lead discussions. And so pairing those assets, right? The university's Nobel Prize winners in these areas with our ability to really do deep textual discussions. Um, I guess I'm again affirming the idea and um, sharing that that is very much on strategy with the types of things that we want to look at in the future because it's a great mix of our unique capabilities with the unique eminence and ideas of the university. Anyone else who wants to um, jump in? I see the great conversation on the PhD track and I'm grateful for that. Any um, comments? We're gonna welcome you to share uh, live here as we come to our final minutes, if you have any. Can yes, please, Ray, go for it. Okay, I'm gonna be probably the only pessimistic person here, but this- That's good, that's what we want, no, we want critical not. thought. It just, I'm listening to this and feeling um, worried that this is going to be so watered down that it's not going to be worth the time. and the. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say this, but there is a difference between graduate school. I spent years in graduate school at the university, and it's different at, 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 at the basic program. It's, it's wonderful, and it took me four years of the basic program to learn how to participate properly at the, at the Graham School, and I'm deeply grateful for that. But there is a difference. We're talking about rigor. There just is a difference in my view in actual graduate school. So I don't know what um, a degree, I mean, a PhD would even mean in that context. And I'm just worried it's going to get so, I don't know, just so big. And I hope it isn't watered down. 
that's all. I mean, I know probably people are hating me all over this, this group. But I'm all. I'm that's sorry. why we have dialogue and inquiry. Um, so <laughs> thank you, right? I mean, I think uh, just to say out loud the obvious, which is we totally share your concern in the sense that the university is, I mean, truly a place that is rigorous and um, everything that we do gets reviewed by a faculty board for that reason, that we want to make sure that we always carry the university's level and standard in any program, non-credit or, you know, credit bearing all the way to a PhD. I mean, I'll acknowledge that if we ever envisioned this at a real level, right, the, the PhD, that would go through um, many levels of review, including ultimately going to all faculty, because any degree here um, goes through a review that all faculty are a part of. And, and anything at this level would have a deep degree of, I won't call it pessimism, I'll, I'll call it <laughs> critical review by faculty, because they would take that honor of being named a doctor by the university at a level that is, you know, incredibly high. So, um, I mean, just know that the review process, in addition to our own internal discipline, the review process in the university would, would absolutely discipline us as well, if that makes sense to uh, the points that you've made. Yes. Um, so, so thank you for your point and we're in total, I, I think, agreement. So you don't have to worry about any, okay. any pessimism there. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Seth. And Zoe, we, thanks. We have Seth. another question about um, enrollment in the chat. And I apologize that I missed it earlier. Um, it's how do you see the enrollment dispersed throughout Graham programs? And I'll just share that um, we are on our way, although we obviously have a lot more to accomplish. Um, since the pandemic, uh, we have grown 35% in our enrollment. So that's a significant growth. And much of that was facilitated by pent up demand, but um, only a few of our programs were online at that point, the, the basic program being one of them. In this new world, obviously, that demand can be satisfied because you can be anywhere and participate in overwhelming, uh, you know, the, the overwhelming number of our offerings, right? So, so we kind of move from a place where most offerings were in person and some were online to most are online and some are in person. And so the change allowed us to, to grow a lot globally. Um, we are looking though now, what we, we feel like that was our initial growth. We're looking now at what we believe is organic demand, meaning um, some of the marketing, some of the new course offerings is leading to new people coming in beyond just the technological aspect. And so as of right now, as we look to autumn and we're not done with enrollment yet, but we're about 15% up. If you look at where we were, you know, three weeks prior to deadlines uh, this year versus last year, which is why Zoe mentioned a number of classes have filled up, which is both happy and sad, I realize. Um, so the reason I share all that is to say that we're on this curve um, and what we're seeing so far is that the number one place where we may see growth is in our existing programs, because those are the longstanding jewels of the school. And so, um, you know, as we retain more people in the basic program, and as we have the largest uh, kind of classes that we've had in a long time graduating each year, you know, I will say that we see that as a continued source of strength and growth. Uh, we also, though, have seen an outpouring, for example, for this timely offering on dimensions of diversity. So, you know, we now have more applications than we can accommodate for that program, and, um, and, and that's at lecture size. And so um, we're really curious, I guess, to, to answer that question. But we know it will be both. We're going to strengthen the programs that have existed for a long time, and we know that growing those is critical because that's still where the distinctiveness of Graham comes from. Uh, but we do see promising opportunities uh, to be in these timely spaces. Um, and a, a final just um, answer to that question is that we see a lot of opportunities as we look to the future um, to hear from you and then to use that user-generated feedback for growth. I'll, I'll just open it up. Uh, Zoe, Jan, Tim, as our program leaders, Kendall, um, anything that any of you want to add because you're at the you know, place where the rubber meets the road on enrollments. Well, I mean, I just echo what you said, Seth. I mean, we are certainly trying to grow all the current programs, the existing programs, and that's a big part of our efforts. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of new programs that are starting as well. And so there's going to be, you know, hopefully a lot of growth in those areas as in addition to what we do for our, our ongoing programs. 
And while you're unmuted, Zoe, there is a question from Bill Higgins that's going to put you on the spot quantitatively. And so, uh, and Kendall has unmuted too. So maybe either, this is a toss up. Um, what is the completion rate for the basic program, those that start versus those that complete year four? We'll, we'll give it an approximate, uh, spontaneous question, you know, any rough numbers that either of you may have on that front. Yeah, it's hard to quantify. I mean, we, we have some retention numbers for that. Uh, I don't know that we've put it in that format, um, but uh, I would say that generally we retain between 70 to 80 percent of the students who begin the program. Um, it varies considerably year to year, so some years have been higher than that and others have been lower than that, um, you know, considering people who started in, in year one going through the four years. Um, but uh, obviously our, our efforts are to increase that retention rate, so that's, that's sort of one of our big goals, but uh, that's been about how it's been working out. Kendall, can I bring you in as well? I see you're off mute. Sure. I just wanted to um, uh, say that uh, year one enrollments, uh, so that'll be new people who will be joining um, the open house next year, presumably. Um, those numbers are are going gangbusters, and uh, uh, I would uh, like to recognize and, and thank our new marketing team um, who are elsewhere on the screen. Well, of course, Sarah's the host. I know that we are at time. Um, I just wanna close by saying how immensely grateful we are. Um, everything we shared is possible because of the incredible learning community. And I'll just leave one other tidbit. Again, we're still getting the data back, but the number one way that people have heard about our programs when we were just in this survey where we're learning kind of how people connect to us and how we connect more people to this incredible institution, the number one way is through our existing learners. And there's something called net promoter score, which is a really technical way of saying, how much do people feel connected and how much do people truly get what you provide and wanna share it? And the numbers, according to the people that did this work, and they work with nonprofits, so they work in a world where people are very connected. Um, they said that they were off the charts, they've never seen numbers you know, at this level. And when you looked into certain specific pieces, so, you know, we can separate out in the data basic program alums or something. The numbers are just absolutely extraordinary. And that is one of the examples that they called out was, you know, these basic program alums, these are the most loyal and incredible, you know, people because they really believe that this is a totally distinctive resource and that more people in the world should be part of it. So um, as Dean, I just want to communicate how much of an honor it is for me to be one of many stewards. You've heard from the others here. Uh, of this extraordinary jewel and how excited we are to partner with you in the upcoming year ahead. So um, thank you for being with us. Uh, we are grateful for your partnership and um, welcome to a new school year. We are, I guess, unofficially welcoming autumn. Um, given our um, quarter system, we will officially welcome it in about three more weeks. So looking forward to uh, learning with all of you in the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.